Hey there, I am getting ready to read the Standard Aesthetics, my lady book. We are on chapter four, Disorders and Diseases of the Skin. Always remember that you are absolutely unique, just like everyone else, Margaret Mead. The learning objectives for this chapter, which starts on page 120, are after completing this chapter, you will be able to one, explain why knowledge of diseases and disorders is valuable for an esthetician. Two, describe how an esthetician and a dermatologist can work collaboratively. Three, identify the differences between primary, secondary, and tertiary skin lesions. Four, recognize skin changes that could indicate a type of skin cancer. Five, describe the types of acne. Six, Describe the symptoms of polycystic ovarian syndrome, PCOS. Seven, list common vascular conditions or disorders. Eight, identify pigment disorders. Nine, describe the different types of dermatitis. Ten, identify the types of hypertrophies. Eleven, define nine contagious skin and nail diseases. Twelve, identify two mental health conditions that may manifest as skin conditions. 13, recognize common skin conditions related to skin diseases and disorders. And 14, explain five sudoriferous gland disorders. So obviously chapter four covers a lot of really important information. We're gonna start in on explain why knowledge of diseases and disorders is valuable for an esthetician. Skin disorders and diseases are fascinating and complex subjects. Estheticians must be knowledgeable about skin disorders and diseases. As an esthetician, it is not within your scope of practice to diagnose skin diseases, but being savvy enough to recognize common medical conditions can help you work with clients more effectively and safety, safely. Estheticians can provide client education and help clients with many of their skin concerns. Individuals that have skin problems can be affected emotionally by dealing with such a visible problem. Clients are in a vul vulnerable position when they bear their skin to you. Sensitivities about visible imperfections can have a lifetime effect on self-esteem. Even in the classroom, permitting our skin to be closely examined by others can be uncomfortable. Use positive words of encouragement and be mindful of how you discuss skin problems tactfully. Never work on any skin condition you do not recognize. When in doubt, stop the service. Let the client know if you did, do not recognize a, a condition or lesion, and they will appreciate your honesty and caution. Posting a photo of your client's skin on social media and asking for advice is not the way to get the right answers on how to treat your client's skin. Estheticians should study and have a thorough understanding of disorders and diseases of skin because Recognizing a potentially contagious skin disorder can stop the spread of infection. You can help individuals that have skin problems and have been affected emotionally by dealing with such a visible problem. Learning when to stop a service and refer a client to a medical professional may save their life. Describe how an esthetician and a dermatologist can work collaboratively. Dermatology is the branch of medical science science that studies and treats the skin and its disorders and diseases. A dermatologist is a physician who treats these disorders and diseases. Recognizing skin disorders and diseases is important for the protection of both the technician and the client. Estheticians may not perform services on clients who have contagious or infectious diseases. Dermatologists, physicians, and nurse practitioners are qualified to diagnose skin problems. Estheticians may not diagnose disorders and diseases of the skin. It is outside of their scope of practice. However, once diagnosed, estheticians can help clients with many common disorders and conditions such as rosacea, acne, and hyperpigmentation. Caution and strict infection control practices are imperative when working with skin disorders. Knowledge of skin conditions and contraindications and contraindicate of treatment is also necessary. Some lesions fit into more than one category and have more than one name or definition. Skin disorders are not easy to categorize as they can have a as diverse as an individual's dealing they can be as diverse as the individuals dealing with the conditions and symptoms. 
Estheticians can work as members of the dermatology team to provide skin care treatments that will help to alleviate many of the symptoms of diagnosed diseases and disorders. See figure 4-1 on page 123. Estheticians are a valuable member of the dermatology team. And in the corner it says caution. Do not attempt to diagnose or treat medical conditions. Estheticians are not licensed to diagnose skin disorders or diseases. Refer clients to a medical professional if you think they have a disorder or disease that needs medical attention. Okay, moving on. Identify the difference between primary, secondary, and tertiary skin, condition, skin lesions. Lesions are structural changes in the tissue caused by damage or injury. Any mark, wound, or abnormality is described as a lesion. The, the three types of lesions are primary, secondary, and tertiary. Some references call tertiary or third type of lesion vascular lesions. Vascular lesions involve the blood or circulatory system. Primary lesions are lesions in the initial stages of development or change. Primary lesions are characterized by flat, non-palpable changes in skin color or by elevations formed by fluid in the cavity such as vesicle or pustules. Vesicles or pustules. Refer to table 4.1 for descriptions for primary lesions of the skin and examples of each. So on pages 124 all the way through, Page 127 is a table of that illustrates lesions, the descriptions, and examples. So I am going to go through and read each example and each type of uh, primary lesion. First, we have a bula. A bula is a large blister containing a watery fluid similar to a vesicle, requires a medical referral. It could be contact dermatitis, a large second degree burn, a bulbous infantago or infantago or pemphigus. I've not heard of that, pemphigus. I've never heard of that one. Okay, so those are bulas. Cyst and tubercle, those are closed abnormally developed sac that contains pus, semifluid, or morbid matter above or below the skin. A cyst can be drained of fluid and a tubercle cannot. They require medical referral. A cyst is a severe acne tubercle, lipoma, erythema nodosum. Sorry for any mispronunciations. A macule is a flat spot or discoloration on the skin. It is a freckle or an age spot. So a macule is just another name for an age spot or freckle. Nodule is a solid bump larger than 0.4 inches or one centimeter that can be easily felt, requires a medical referral. It could be swollen lymph nodes, rheumatoid, rheumatoid nodules. A papule is a small elevation on the skin that contains no fluid but may develop pus. That could be acne, warts, or an elevated nevi. Pustule is a raised inflamed papule with white or yellow center containing pus in the top of the lesion. That can be acne, infantago, or folliculitis. A tumor is an abnormal mass varying in size, shape, and color any size of abnormal mass, not always cancer, but requires medical referral. That could be an example as cancer. Vesicle. A vesicle is a small blister or sac containing clear fluid lying within or just beneath the epidermis. Requires a medical referral if cause is unknown or untreatable with over-the-counter products. Examples would be poison ivy or poison oak. A wheel is an itchy swollen lesion that can be caused by a blow scratch bite of an insect or urticaria, which is a skin allergy or the sting of nettle. So typically resolves on its own, but referral to a physician should be considered when the condition lasts more than three days. That could be hives or mosquito bites. So hives or mosquito bites are wheels. All right, now page 126, we're on to secondary lesions. We have secondary skin lesions are characterized by piles of material on skin surface, such as a crust or scab, 
or by depressions in the skin surface, such as an ulcer. These may require medical referral, and it says refer to Table 4.2 for examples of identifying of secondary lesions. So page 126 and 127 are um, secondary lesions, so it's a full table, and I'm going to go ahead and read through them. So for a crust, we have dead cells that form over a wound or blemish while healing, accumulation of sebum and pus sometimes mixed with epidermal cells. So that would be a scab or a sore. Exoneration, that is skin sore or abrasion produced by scratching or scraping. Nail cuticle damage from nail biting is an example of that. A fissure is a crack in the skin that penetrates the dermis. So severely cracked and or chapped hands or lips or feet. So in the winter time, we sometimes develop fissures on our feet or on our hands or lips because they're very dry. Uh, keloid, a thick scar resulting from excessive growth or fibrous tissue. Keloids will form along any type of scar for people susceptible to them. So examples, there aren't any listed. A keloid can happen anywhere on the body. Uh, some people are just predisposed to get them. Secondary lesion, a scale is an example. Thin, dry, or oily plate of epidermal flakes. Excessive dandruff or psoriasis. A scar or cicatrix is a slightly raised or depressed area on the skin that forms as a result of the healing process related to an injury or lesion. So that would be like a post-operative repair. So stitches that form a scar. An ulcer is an open lesion on the skin or mucous membrane of the body accompanied by loss of skin depth and possibly weeping of fluids and pu or pus. Requires medical referral, particularly in clients with underlying medical conditions such as diabetes. Examples of ulcers are chicken pox and herpes. Okay, and on page 128, Let's see, it says recognize skin changes that could indicate a type of skin cancer. Skin cancer risks increases with cumulative ultraviolet sun exposure and is found in three distinct forms that vary in severity. Each form is named for a type of cells that are affected. Skin cancer is caused by damage to DNA. Skin cancers form when cells begin to divide rapidly and unevenly. See the skin cancer and sun exposure infograph for some facts on skin cancer. If detected early, these abnormal growths can be removed. If not taken care of, they can be deadly. Skin cancer and sun exposure. About 91,270 new melanomas will be diagnosed every year. Skin cancer is the most common cancer diagnosis for men over 50. About 9,320 people are expected to die of melanoma every year. More than 90% of skin cancer is caused by sun exposure. Non-melanoma skin cancer is caused by the UV rays from the sun. One person dies of melanoma every hour. One in five Americans will be diagnosed in their lifetime with skin cancer. One bad burn in childhood doubles the risk factor for melanoma later in life. A blistering sunburn during childhood increases the risk of melanoma as an adult. Melanoma is the deadliest form of skin cancer. Skin cancer kills more women in their late 20s and early 30s than breast cancer does. There is a 75% increase of melanoma risk among those who use tanning beds in their teens and 20s. Using sensitivity and concern suggests that the client seeking medical advice without diagnosing or speculating about the disorder. For example, you could say, I'm concerned about this area on your forehead. Before I do any treatment on it, I need you to see a healthcare provider for an evaluation. I'll perform your service today and avoid this area. Clients will appreciate your concern and know that you have their best interests at heart. Annual medical skin checks are recommended for everyone to look for changes in their skin. Act actinic keratinosis. Actinic keratinosis is a pink or flesh-colored precancerous lesion that feels sharp or rough and is a result of sun damage. It should be checked by a dermatologist. Types of skin cancer. 
There are three main types of skin cancer. Return, refer to table 4.3 for a description of each. So table 4.3, types of skin cancer. Moles, we have a normal mole, which is a small brownish spot on the skin ranging in color from pale tan to brown or bluish black. Note, this is not a type of skin cancer. So they've got a picture of just a regular mole. We all have them, and that is not a type of skin cancer. Then we get into basal cell carcinoma, most common and least severe type of skin cancer, which often appears as light pearly nodules. Characteristics include sores, reddish patches, or a smooth growth of the elevated border. Next is squamous cell carcinoma. This is a more serious, uh, more serious condition than basal cell carcinoma, characterized by scaly red or pink papules or nodules, also appear as open sores or crusty areas, can grow and spread in the body. So you'll wanna take a close look at these examples. Next we have malignant melanoma. This is the most serious form of skin cancer as it can spread quickly or mastocize. Black or dark patches on the skin are usually uneven in texture, jagged or raised. Melanomas may have surface crust or bleed. Malignant melanoma is the least common but is 100% fatal if left untreated. Early detection and treatment can result in a 94% five-year survival rate, but it drops drastically once it's reached a local lymph node. Infrequent intense UV exposure may increase the risk for melanoma more than chronic continuous exposure does. People with light skin and a tendency to burn with sun exposure are more susceptible to skin cancer. Page 130, Oncology Aesthetics. A medical niche has emerged for the esthetician certified in oncology aesthetics. As referenced in chapter one, oncology is the medical study of cancer, its causes and treatments. Treating skin that has been exposed to radiation and chemotherapy requires a depth of knowledge beyond basic aesthetics. The skin can be much more fragile and reactive. Additionally, you don't want to provide any treatment or skincare products that could be contraindicated with the cancer treatment. Clients with cancer still need the healing benefits of touch and can additionally benefit from skincare treatments that are soothing and calming. ABCDEs of melanoma detection. The American Cancer Society recommends using the ABCDE skin cancer checklist to help make potential skin cancer easier to recognize. When checking existing moles, look for changes in any of the following, figure 4-2. So A for asymmetry, the two sides of the lesion are not identical. B, border, the border is irregular on these lesions. C, color, Melanomas are usually dark and have more than one color or colors that fade into one another. D, diameter. The lesion in a melanoma is usually at least the size of a pencil eraser. E, evolving. Melanoma as a lesion often changes appearance. Okay, so as you'll see, figure two, we have normal moles compared to cancerous moles that show signs of asymmetry and changes in border color and diameter. So definitely take a good look at that. Uh, moving on to page 131. Did you know Skinny on Skin is one program from the Impact Melanoma Organization focused on educating beauty professionals to detect early signs of cancer. It is available for free. For more information, contact www.impactmelanoma.org. I will check that out. Okay, top of page 131. Changes to any of these characteristics should be examined by a medical professional. For more information, you can contact the American Cancer Society at www.cancer.org or, and they provided a phone number, 1-800-ACS-2345. As estheticians, we may see our clients much more regularly than a client will see their medical provider. We can be key in noting a skin change and referring the client to a dermatologist for diagnosis and treatment. 
Okay, so now we talked about uh, precancers and cancerous lesions. Now we're gonna move on to describe the different types of acne, which is also very important for us to understand as estheticians. Acne is an inflammatory skin disorder of the sebaceous glands, medically known as acne simplex or acne vulgaris. It is, a, it is characterized by excess sebum production. This excess oil in dead skin cells can plug pores, creating comedones, papules, and pustules, and cysts. This, cause, uh, this causes a growth of P. acne bacteria. I'm not even going to try to pronounce that. P. acne bacteria. Bacteria in the follicles are anaerobic. That is, the bacteria cannot live in the presence of oxygen. When follicles are blocked with sebum and dead skin buildup, oxygen cannot reach to the bottom of the follicle. Sebum can irritate follicles and cause inflammation. As bacteria and inflammation grow, pressure is exerted on the follicle wall. If the wall ruptures, it becomes infected and debris spills out onto the dermis. Redness and inflammation occur when the foreign debris created from the dead white blood cells is detected in the skin and white blood cells move in to fight the infection. Papules are red inflamed lesions caused by this process. Papules may become more infected and pus develops. These infected papules become, become pustules. Pustules are filled with fluid from dead white blood cells that fought the infection. Cysts are nodules made up of deep pockets of infection. Skin forms hardened tissue around the infection to stop the spread of bacteria, which can cause to both depressed and raise scars from damage to the dermal tissue. Because it is in the dermis, this variety of acne called cystic acne should be treated by a medical professional. Causes of clogged follicles. Acne is something your client may have to deal with throughout their lives in various stages. <clears throat> it is important for you to understand the causes of acne and treatments to best serve your client. Your consultation and assessment will be important as you develop treatment, a treatment plan that will take the causes of acne into consideration. Knowledge of the anatomy of the pili sebaceous unit gives you a deeper understanding of how acne behaves. Polysebaceous unit is the term for the entire follicle that includes the hair shaft, sebaceous gland, and sebaceous duct or canal to the surface. The hairless follicle with attached sebaceous glands is the main follicle involved in acne. Clogged follicles are caused by many factors including excess oil, retention hyperkeratosis, and sebaceous filaments. Another reason follicles get clogged is that the opening or the os of the follicle may be too small to let impactions out. Notable sebaceous gland conditions and disorders are discussed in the following section. Uh, we have types of clogged follicles. The types of clogged follicles include the following. The comedo, which is a non-inflamed buildup of cells, sebum, and de other debris inside the follicle, see figure 4-3. And in figure 4-3, we have an example of a comedo that is just blackheads on a nose, which is pretty common. An open comedo is a blackhead open at the surface and is exposed to air. When the follicle is filled with excess oil, a blackhead forms. It is, a, it is dark because it exposed to oxygen and oxidation occurs. A closed comedo forms when the opening of the follicles are blocked with debris and white cells. It is also referred to as a whitehead, but should not be confused with the more hardened type of papules called milia. Sebaceous filaments. Sebaceous filaments are similar to open comedones, are mainly small solidified impactions of oil without the cell matter. These filaments also block the follicle and can cause an acne breakout. They are often found on the nose. Milia. Milia are small epidermal cysts that appear as firm white papules. Milia are whitish pearl-like masses of sebum and dead cells under the skin with no visible opening and are often mistakenly called whiteheads. Whiteheads look similar but are soft. Hardened and closed over, milia are more common in dry skin types and may form after skin trauma, such as laser resurfacing or chronic exposure to UV radiation. 
Newborns can sometimes get milia at birth or shortly thereafter. They resemble small sesame seeds that are almost always perfectly round. They are usually found around the eyes, cheeks, and forehead. Milia can also be caused by blocked follicular openings from oil-based moisturizers. Treatment for milia. Depending on the state, milia can be treated in a salon or spa. Increasing exfoliation and using a retinol product can thin the stratum corneum and gradually eradicate milia. Another treatment option is using an extraction tool to make a tiny opening in the epidermis to expose the milia. With gentle pressure, they usually can be removed from the opening. If they do not pop out, it is best to leave them alone and they will often decompress with regular cleansing, exfoliation, and retinol application. Retention hyperkeratosis. Retention hyperkeratosis is a hereditary factor in which dead skin cells build up because they do not shed from the follicles as they do normal skin. Additionally, excessive sebum production can overtax the sebaceous follicle and cause further cell buildup. Sebum mixed with cells in the follicle become comedones plug, or plugs in the follicle. Consequently, open and closed comedones are formed. While not inflamed, these comedones are the beginning of acne problems if they are not treated with proper skin care to alleviate the impaction. Next, we have sebaceous hyperplasia. Sebaceous hyperplasia involves benign lesions frequently seen in oilier areas of the face. They are often white, yellow, or flesh colored. Sebaceous hyperplasia is described as a donut shape with an indention in the center. Sebaceous material may be found in the center. As cell turnover rate slows with age and androgen levels decline, this causes abnormal cell buildup with very little oil that crowds and enlarge sebaceous glands. Do not mistake these overgrowths of sebaceous gland for comedones or milia, which may look similar at first. These harmless lesions can be, cannot be removed by extraction. Cryotherapy, surgery, and laser, laser excision are recommended treatment options. Subarea. Subarea is a severe oiliness of the skin, an abnormal secretion from the sebaceous glands. When it is on the scalp, it is called dandruff or subareic dermatitis, but it can occur around the eyebrows, behind the ears, and around the nose or other areas on the face. It is not acne, although the inflammation in the skin from subarea can be misclassified as acne. Later in this chapter, you will learn more about subareic dermatitis. Page 132, we have grades of acne. Acne is graded on a scale of one to four, Grade one is mild and usually treated with over-the-counter skincare, whereas grade four has progressed to a consistent breakouts and deep cysts that require medical intervention. So very important on page 134, table 44, we have pictures of different grades of acne. So grade one includes minor breakouts, mostly open comedones, some closed comedones, and few papules. Grade two, many closed comedones, more open comedones, and occasional papules and pustules. Grade three, red and inflamed, many comedones, papules and pustules. Grade four is cystic acne, cyst with comedones, papules, pustules, and inflammation. Scar formation from tissue damage is common in grade four. So now we're gonna talk about acne triggers. Genetic, hormonal, environment, lifestyle, certain products, and dietary influences affect acneic breakouts. During the consultation, you can ask questions about each of these subjects and learn more to develop a treatment plan to help your client. Educating your client about each of the following factors and getting your client's cooperation in making changes can improve acneic breakouts. Page 135, Genetics. You need to know if your client's parents had acne during puberty or any other time and whether other family members have acne. If acne is a familial disorder, your client's acne will be influenced by the DNA programming. Treatment for genetic influences. If acne has a genetic component, your client needs to understand that you can help get the breakouts under control, but curing the acne will not be possible. With a comprehensive approach that addresses skin holistically, your clients will experience the best improvements in their skin. Hormones. 
The androgen fluctuations during puberty, monthly menstrual cycles, hormone surges, pregnancy, perimenopause contribute to oil production changes that can bring on comedones, papules, and pustules that, that usually evidence themselves periodically. Premenstrual water retention can cause slight swelling, enough to influence the epidermis and block polysebaceous units. During the consultation, you may have to dig deeper to get a better understanding of hormonally induced acne. You may suggest your client see their medical professional for a change in birth control prescriptions. If the acne developed when the client started on a pill or an IUD birth control or following a hormone injection, hormonal injection, if the acne is a result of hormonal changes during pregnancy and perimenopause, you can let your client know that its severity will change as the pregnancy progresses and hormonal fluctuations shift. Your client may be able to influence the breakouts that occur from menstrual cycle hormone surges by limiting sodium intake and increasing water intake. Treatment for hormonal influences. Treatment options for hormonal induced acne include additional exfoliation to keep the stratum corneum thin so oil can escape to the surface more easily. Commonly, this includes chemical peels, enzyme peels, and microdermabrasion options. Home care products can include antibacterial cleansers, salicylic acid-based products that are lipophilic and water-based moisturizers. Environment. Working in an environment with poor air quality, pollutants, or comedogenic exposure can increase the inflammatory response of sebaceous glands. Dramatic climate changes, including changes in season, humidity, and temperature, influence oil production. Understanding your client's work environment is another aspect of the puzzle you will be solving when helping your client with acne. Does your client work around oils, chemicals, grease, or ink? Does your client work in an area with poor air quality? Is your client exposed to high levels of carbon dioxide from car exhaust in an environment? Treatment for environmental influences. Encouraging your client to cleanse their face at the end of the workday to remove res residual pollution, oil, grime, and other pore clogging factors can improve skin quality. Occlusive products may be too heavy and trap bacteria. Treatments that exfoliate as well as oxygenate the skin can help. The P. acne bacteria cannot live in an environment rich with oxygen. Lifestyle. Stress can stimulate the adrenal glands to produce more hormones, which leads to more oil production. Did your client recently start a new job or lose employment? Has your client had a romantic breakup or recently got engaged or married? Has there been a death in the family or a loss of a close friend? A move to a new home or a new town? What about a challenging home situation? A long commute can contribute to stress. Adrenal glands that are constantly excreting adrenaline to keep up with the pace of an overly active lifestyle can create a hormonal imbalance that can affect the skin. Pressure or friction from a cell phone along with wearing hats or scarves and any other device or object that routinely touches the face can transfer bacteria to the face and induce a breakout. Fragrances from dryer sheets, laundry detergents, or shampoos can cause a sensitivity and a breakout. Treatment for lifestyle influences. Suggesting lifestyle changes to your client can help them find the triggers that stimulate an acne flare-up. Sometimes a simple fi fix, such as more frequent changing of a pillowcase, can make a difference. <clears throat> Cosmetics and skincare products. Certain ingredients and products can aggravate acne. Fatty ingredients such as waxes and some oils can clog or irritate follicles. These comedogenic ingredients can block follicles, which causes cell buildup, resulting in comedones. Products rich in emollients and inclusive products are too heavy for skin prone to acne breakouts. Moisturizers and sunscreen should be light formulas such as oil and water emulsions, not water and oil emulsions. Many makeup products are comedogenic, especially foundations and powders that are made with solids and fatty ingredients. Makeup products become contaminated with unhygienic application techniques. Products for hair and skin can trigger or irritate acne. Products are discussed thoroughly in Chapter 6, Skincare Products, Chemistry, Ingredient, and Selection. 
treatment for product irritation. Educating your client on routine cleaning of makeup brushes and the use of disposable sponges to apply foundation can help with breakouts. Diet. An increasing number of studies are linking food allergies or sensitivities to acne. Foods with a higher glucose index, processed foods, foods heavy with iodide content, and dairy are thought to be contributors to acne, although the relationship is not yet fully understood. <clears throat> Page 137. Treatment for dietary influences. You are not a nutritionist or a dietitian, but you can encourage your clients to eat healthy, eat a healthy diet and drink plenty of water. You can suggest clients see a specialist for dietary changes that may improve the health of their skin. Medicated treatment options for acne. Regular skincare sessions with exfoliation and incorporating modalities like high frequency, microdermabrasion, and chemical peels can help keep the stratum corneum thin keep oil production under control, add hydration, and oxygenate the skin to eliminate bacteria. Electrical devices and chemical exfoliation are covered in Chapter 10. Facial devices and technology in Chapter 13, Advanced Topics and Treatments. However, treatment options for acne can also include a collaborative approach with medical professionals and the esthetician. They are varied and include the use of topical antibacterial agents to eliminate the P. acne bacteria, See Table 4-5. Antibiotics can be used both orally and topically. The potential for developing antibiotic resistant is the reason why medical professionals are reducing the use of these drugs to treat chronic acne. If the client requires a serious infection later in life, antibiotics may not work to fight the infection because of the antibiotic resistance that developed during long-term use to help improve acne. So table four or five are common medications used in the treatment of acne. So I'm just going to list the drugs themselves. You can look at the actions and the potential side effects. So please take note of um, the drugs and this is definitely something we need to know as estheticians because of the, some of these are contraindications um, for different treatments that we're able to do. So um, one very common is adapalene, which is known as Differin. We've all heard of that. Azelaic acid, brand name Azelex. Birth control pills are sometimes used to help control acne. Clindamycin, isotretinoin, spironolactone, tazertine or Tazerac is the brand name, and tretinoin, which is Retin-A. <clears throat> Moving on to page 138, considerations for medicated acne treatment. You can't cure acne, but you can help control the breakouts. The passage of time is often the cure as teens move out of puberty, perimenopause transitions to menopause, or a stressful life lifestyle habits change. You can help your client have more confidence in social situations with clearer skin. More information on acne medications available to clients include the following. Home care products should include ingredients with benzoyl peroxide and vitamin A products like tretinoin, retinoids, and adapalene. Moisturizers and serums that are low on the comedogenic scale are best. Skincare ingredients are discussed in Chapter 6, Skincare Products, Chemistry, Ingredients, and Selection. Benzoyl peroxide are often combined with topical antibiotics. This combination helps reduce the chances of develop, developing antibiotic resistance. Topical antibiotics alone aren't typically prescribed. These products should be applied in the morning because they can discolor pillowcases. Vitamin A products should be applied in the evening because they are photosynthesizing. Clients should apply a very small pea-sized amount beginning twice a week, increasing the application to three times a week. The, then use the product every other day and finally every day as tolerance to the product is developed. These products work by thinning the stratum corneum, increasing cell turnover, and preventing hair follicles from becoming clogged with sebum and dead skin cells. Salicylic acid and azelaic acid are both antibacterial. Salicylic acid is lipophilic, so it works to digest sebum. Oral medications to help with acne in addition to antibiotics are often drugs to counter the effects of androgen hormones. An example is spironolactone. 
Birth control pills are another prescription medication that can influence acne, reducing breakouts from, in horm from hormonally induced acne. All right, on page 139, describe the symptoms of polycystic ovarian syndrome, PCOS. PCOS, often shortened and pronounced PCOS, is the hormonal condition that affects one in 20 women in their childbearing years, according to the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, see figure 4-4. It is believed to have a genetic component. Symptoms include increased androgen production that causes the development of cysts on the ovaries. The cysts create irregular menstrual cycles and difficulty with fertility. Clients with PCOS are insulin resistant and have challenges with weight loss. Sleep apnea is also a symptom. The estheticians work, will work with the client who has PCOS because PCOS symptoms include acne, thinning hair and male hair growth patterns of baldness, which are sparse hair density at the front and top of the scalp. It, is, it also causes abnormal hair growth on the face, arms, thighs, neck, and breasts. Clients with PCOS may feel self-conscious about their body image. They may feel they've lost control on many levels. PCOS is not a condition that is cured, but symptoms can be managed. Birth control pills help regulate the sex hormones and androgen blocking medications can help control hair growth and acne issues. Performing hair removal treatments with waxing and laser services can help keep unwanted hair under better control. Skin care treatments using ingredients that influence the formation of comedones keep the stratum corneum thin. Treatments that influence acne breakouts like microdermabrasion, high frequency, and ultrasonic skin scrubber are helpful. Additional providing emotional support can help your client. I'm gonna flip back to page 139 and there's an illustration on 4.4 that I referred to that talks about PICO symptoms. I'm gonna go through and uh, read all of these. So common PICO symptoms, excessive body hair growth, weight changes and trouble losing weight, ovarian cysts, low sex, dr sex drive, irregular or missed periods, male pattern baldness or thinning hair, high testosterone levels, insulin resistance, fatigue, acne, mood changes, or trouble conceiving or infertility. Okay, back to page 140. List common vascular conditions or disorders. Vascular conditions and disorders can be hard for a client to deal with, so it is important to understand the types to better help your client. As mentioned earlier, these types of vascular lesions may be considered tertiary lesions. Rosacea. Rosacea is an inflammatory and vascular disorder with multiple causes that are not completely understood. It is a progressive disorder that starts with flushing and increasing bouts of redness. Visible vessels and skin sensitivity are, sim are symptoms. The symptoms can pro progress to pustular type breakouts that can be confused with acne. Rosacea can affect the eyes as well, causing chronic bloodshot eyes, some clear to yellowish discharge, and irritation. In advanced cases, the rosacea can cause skin thickening, particularly around the nose. This symptom is called rhinophema. Rosacea can be challenging to treat because of its unclear origins. Hereditary bacteria and dermidex mite and fungus are all possible theories. Certain factors are known to aggravate the condition. Vasodilation or vascular dilation of the blood vessels makes rosacea worse. Spicy foods, alcohol, caffeine, temperature extremes, heat, sun, and stress aggravate rosacea symptoms. Rosacea treatments. Like acne, estheticians can treat the symptoms of rosacea but cannot cure the disorder. Symptom management is the goal when working with a rosacea client. Rosacea treatment should include collaboration with medical professionals, antifungal prescription skin care products may help. Skin calming ingredients and treatments will help decrease the inflammation, providing soothing facials and gentle massage and light exfoliation. Limit the use of steam. Adding high frequency to oxygenate the skin can help. Some advanced aesthetic procedures with laser, IPL, and radiofrequency devices can be effective. Next is telangiostasia. Telangiostasia is visible capillaries, 0.5 to 1 millimeter in diameter, that are commonly found on the face, particularly around the nose, cheeks, and chin. 
They can appear, appear due to an injury, hereditary rosacea, hormonal changes, or exposure to extreme cold or heat. Matting of tiny telangiostasia creates a ruddy complex called cuprous skin. Telangiostasia is a cosmetic irregularity and is not a medical condition. Varicose veins. Varicose veins are visible vascularity that are abnormal di abnormally dilated and twisted veins that occur anywhere in the body. They are often on the legs. Pregnancy, extended periods of time standing and sitting, and genetics are contributing factors. Sometimes treatments with sclerotherapy, an injection into the vein with a solution that causes the vein to collapse, can cause smaller vessels to disappear. Varicose veins are a condition that should be treated by a medical professional. Such treatment could include surgery for large twisted vessels. All right, let's make sure I didn't skip any pages. Nope. I'm now on page 142, identify pigment disorders. The genetic background of a person influence pigmentation disorders. Abnormal pigmentation referred to as dyschromia can be caused by various internal and external factors. Hyperpigmentation, overproduction of pigment, and hypopigmentation, a lack of pigment, are the two types of pigmentation disorders. Sun exposure is the biggest external cause of pigmentation disorders and can make existing pigmentation disorders worse. Drugs can, may also cause skin pigmentation abnormalities. Hyperpigmentation is a frequent concern for clients and is discussed in subsequent chapters. See figure 4-8. <clears throat> Hyperpigmentation. Hyperpigmentation appears in the following forms. Melasma. Melasma is a type of hormonal hyperpigmentation disorder that first appears during pregnancy or with the use of birth control pills. Melasma has an identifiable pattern of solid, fairly symmetrical hyperpigmentation, often on the forehead, cheeks, upper lip, and chin. Sun exposure can exacerbate the pigmentation of melasma, so a person may have melasma and sun damage. Addressing the symptoms of melasma can be challenging for an esthetician. The pigmentation can fade during times of low UV exposure. Hormones returning to normal levels after pregnancy will alleviate the pigmentation. The consistent use of melanocyte inhibiting skincare products as well as sunscreen application is essential. A series of chemical peels can lighten the pigmentation. Some high energy laser devices with nanosecond or picosecond technology and fractional radio frequency treatments can offer visible improvements. Melasma is a condition that requires management. There is no cure. <clears throat> Lentigo. Lentigo is a flat pigmented area similar to a freckle, small yellowish brown spots. spots. Lentigenes, lentigenes are simple pigmented lesion, multiple pigmented lesions. Medical professionals identify lentigenes as the result of sunlight exposure as actinic or solar lentigenes. Your, cl your clients may call them age spots as they are associated with aging skin. So lentigo is just age spots. Ephalids, also known as freckles, are tiny rounder oval pigmented areas of skin on areas exposed to the sun, also referred to as macules. They are small, flat, colored spots on the skin. So, freckles can be called macules or ephalids. A nevus, also known as a birthmark, is a malformation of the skin from abnormal pigmentation or dilated cap capillaries that is present at birth or appears shortly after birth. A port wine stain is a vascular type of nevus is an example of a pigmented nevus, is an example of a, and then figure 412B is an example of a vascular nevus. So the nevuses on page 143, there's a diagram showing a regular pigmented nevus, and then there's a figure of a vascular nevus. And back on page 142, we had several different figures. We had examples of hyperpigmentation, melasma marking on a face, and then lentigo on hands or age spots. Okay, uh, on page 143 on figure 413, we have post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation, and we're getting ready to read about that. So we have picoloderma or 
CVOT is a skin condition caused by actinic bronzing or chronic sun exposure to the sides of the face and neck. The skin turns a reddish brown hue with a distinct white patch under the chin. Picoloderma is benign, meaning it is not cancerous. Treatment can be a combination of melanocyte inhibiting skincare, chemical peels, advanced treatment with lasers and IPLs, consistent skin sunscreen protection, and avoiding irritants, such as heavy fragrances on the skin. Post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation. Post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation is darkening pigmentation due to an injury to the skin or the residual healing after an acne lesion has been resolved. It is often deep red, purple, or brown in appearance. Tan. A tan results from sun, from sun exposure. Tanning is a change in pigmentation due to melanin production as its defense against UV radiation that damages the skin. A tan is basically visible skin and cell damage. Page 144, hypopigmentation. Hypopigmentation occurs in various forms. It is seen less commonly than hyperpigmentation disorders. Leucoderma. Leucoderma is a loss of pigmentation leading to light abnormal patches of depigmented skin. It is a congenial disorder acquired due to immunological and post-inflammatory causes. Vitiligo and albinism are leucodermas. All right, so leucoderma can be albinism or vitiligo. And we have an example of uh, vitiligo on page 144, figure 414. Oh, I'm not there yet. Oh, yes, I am. Albinism. Albinism is a rare genetic condition characterized by a lack of melanin pigment in the body, including the skin, hair, and eyes. The person is at risk for skin cancer, is sensitive to light, and ages early without normal melanin protection. The technical term for albinism is congenit congenital leucoderma or congenital hypopigmentation. Next is vitiligo. Vitiligo is a pigmentation disease characterized by white irregular patches of skin that are totally lacking pigment. The condition can worsen with time and sunlight. The disease can occur at any age and is believed to be an autoimmune disorder causing the absence of melanocytes. Tinea versicolor. Tinea versicolor, also known as pitter Riasis versicolor is a fungal condition that inhibits melanin production. It is not contagious because it is caused by yeast, a normal part of the human skin. It is characterized by white, brown, or salmon-colored flaky patches. Sun exposure can stimulate the growth of the fungus. This fungus can be treated with antifungal cream or other medications. Selenium sulfide shampoos can also treat the condition. High humidity and summer heat simulate the condition. It usually fades in the cold winter season and reoccurs in warmer weather. To a lay person, tinea versicolor can be misinterpreted as vitiligo, so referral to a medical professional is important. And there is a good picture of that on figure 415 on page 144 of the tinea versicolor. Okay, with page 145, describe the different types of dermatitis. Okay, pay close attention uh, to why different types of dermatitis occur because I've seen these pop up on several of my tests so far, so I'm certain that I'm gonna be seeing this on state boards. Uh, dermatitis is a generalized term to refer to an inflammatory condition of the skin. Various forms include lesions such as eczema, vesicles, or papules. Dermatitis has many forms and symptoms of one form can be confused with symptoms of another form. Referral to a medical professional is recommended for appropriate diagnosis. Types of dermatitis or inflammation of the skin include the following. Contact dermatitis. Occupational disorders from ingredients in cosmetics and chemical solutions can cause contact dermatitis. Contact with allergens and caustic chemicals can also cause skin sensitivity or disorders. Allergies and skin eruptions are common. Wearing gloves or protective skin creams while working with chemicals or irritating substances can help prevent contact dermatitis. Uh, on page 145, figure 416, there is an example of dermatitis on the face. Allergic contact dermatitis. <clears throat> 
Allergic contact dermatitis is caused by exposure to and direct skin contact with an allergen. Normally, the immune system protects us from pathogens and disease, but with an allergic reaction to immu the immune system causes the problem by trying to do its job too well. An allergic reaction occurs when our immune system mistakes a benign substance for a toxic one and initiates a major defense against it. Initial exposure to an allergen does not always cause an allergic reaction. The development of hypersensitivity is a result of repeated exposure to an allergen over time. The process is called sensitization, and it may take months or years depending on the allergen and the intensity of the exposure. Also remember that different people develop allergies to different allergens. Individual predisposition to allergies may be inherited. Sensitivity seems to run in families. Contact dermatitis and red itchy skin can be caused by an allergic reaction or contact with an irritant such as these common allergens, makeup, skincare products, detergents, or dyes. I'm gonna read in the box on 145, it says caution. The following reactions from chemicals are commonly seen in the salon. On the practitioner's fingers, palms, or the back of the hand. On the practitioner's face, especially the cheeks. On the client's scalp, hairline, forehead, or neckline. If you examine the area where the problem occurs, you can usually determine the cause. For example, technicians may react to chemicals in disinfectants or strong skincare products. This is both prolonged and repeated contact. Sensitization is an increased or exaggerated sensitivity to products. Wear gloves to avoid potential reactions. Eyes and lungs can, lungs can also be affected by exposure to strong chemicals or other ingredients. <clears throat> Okay, page 146. Oh, that list continued for contact dermatitis. Some of the other common allergens are fabrics, jewelry, plants, red dye and products, or nickel and jewelry. Okay, now we have atopic dermatitis. Atopic dermatitis is a chronic relapsing form of dermatitis. Ir irritants and allergens trigger reactions that include dry, cracked skin, the redness, itching, and dehydration of the dermatitis make the condition worse. Use of hum humidifiers and lotion can help keep the skin more hydrated. Topical corticosteroids can relieve the symptoms. So 417, we have a picture of atopic dermatitis caused by allergens. And then we have eczema. Eczema is an inflammatory, painful, itching disease of the skin, is acute or chronic in nature, and has dry or moist lesions. A client with eczema should be referred to a physician. Avoid contact and skincare treatments if a client has eczema. And figure 418, we have someone with eczema on their hands. Irritant contact dermatitis. Everyone who comes in contact with an irritant is affected by irritant reactions, although the degree of irritation will vary depending on the individual. In acute cases, symptoms are noticed immediately or within just a few hours. Chronic cases may be delayed reactions that take weeks, months, or even years to develop. Symptoms range from redness, swelling, scaling, and itching to serious painful chemical burns. See figure 419. Irritating substances temporarily damage the epidermis. Caustic substances are examples of irritants. When the skin is damaged by irritating substances, the immune system springs into action. It floods the tissue with water, trying to dilute the irritant, therefore swelling occurs. The immune system also releases histamines, which enlarge the vessels around the body. Blood then can rush to the area more quickly and help remove the irritating substance. The extra blood under the skin is easily visible. The entire area becomes red and warm and it may throb. Histamines cause the itchy feeling that over accompanies contact dermatitis. After everything calms down, the swelling will go away. The surrounding skin is often less left damaged, scaly, cracked, and dry. Fortunately, irritations are not permanent. If you avoid repeated or prolonged contact with the irritating substance, the skin will usually quickly repair itself. However, continued or repeated exposure may lead to chronic allerg allergic reactions and skin damage. You may notice irritant contact dermatitis when a teen client comes in for an acne consultation. 
You may notice a breakout on the client's chin and learn that they play football. You must rule out the possibility of irritant contact dermatitis for the football helmet chin strap before beginning a treatment plan for acne. We are on page 147 now, perioral dermatitis. Perioral dermatitis is the acne-like condition around the mouth consisting mainly of small clusters of papules. It may be caused by toothpaste or products used on the face. It is not contagious. Antibiotics can help treat the condition. This is why it's always important to brush your teeth before you wash your face at night. Subareic dermatitis. Subareic dermatitis is a form of eczema char characterized by inflammation, dry or oily, scaling or crusting, and or itchiness. The red flaky skin often appears in the eyebrows, on the scalp along the hairline, in the middle of the forehead and along sides of the nose. One cause is inflammation of the sebaceous glands. This condition is sometimes treated with cortisone creams. Severe cases should be referred to a dermatologist. Uh, so we have figure 421. It shows seborrheic dermatitis behind the ear. And stasis dermatitis is next. Stasis dermatitis is caused by poor circulation in the lower legs that can create a common chronic inflammatory state. The legs may sometimes have ulcer ulcerations sorry, along with scaly skin, itching, and hyperpigmentation. The hyperpigmentation is caused by homocytorin staining a brown reddish discoloration due to iron deposits in the blood leaking into the tissues. A client with this type of skin disorder needs cardiovascular referral. Even when the circulatory issues are resolved, the homocytorin staining can remain. Advanced aesthetic treatments with IPL can improve the appearance. And there is a picture of that on page 147. 148. Did you know Poison ivy is a common allergen. Although approximately 75% of the population is allergic to poison ivy, the remaining 25% will never have a reaction no matter how many times they're exposed. Individuals who are not predisposed never become sensitized and will not develop a re an allergic reaction. Okay, so we're on page 148 and now we are identify, identifying the types of hypertrophies. Hypertrophy is defined as an abnormal growth. Many are benign or harmless. However, some growths are pre-malignant pre or malignant and can be dangerous or cancerous. The term hypertrophic is used to describe thickening of a tissue. The opposite of hypertrophy is atrophy, which means wasting away or thinning. Keloids are an example of hypertrophies. Types of hypertrophies include the following. Hyperkeratosis, which is the thickening of the skin caused by a mass of keratinocytes, keratoma, an acquired thickening pa thickened patch of epidermis, a callus caused by pressure or friction is a keratoma. If the thickening also grows inward, it becomes a corn. Keratosis is an abnormally thick buildup of skin cells, and keratosis polaris is redness and bumpiness in the cheeks, upper arms, or thighs caused by block follicles. It has the appearance of quote unquote chicken skin, and it has an example in figure 423. It is not well understood, but is often genetic and disappears after the age of 30. Many young women feel self-conscious about the condition and will seek an esthetician's help. Topical chemical exfoliants that keep the follicles free of keratin like alpha hydroxyl acid or beta hydroxyl acid products along with light mechanical exfoliation can help unblock follicles and alleviate the rough feeling. Care must be taken to prevent too aggressive of an approach and disturb the acid mantle balance causing dermatitis or infection. A mole. A mole is a pigmented nevus a brownish spot ranging in color from tan to bluish and black. Some are flat resembling freckles, others are raised and darker. Most are benign, but changes in mole color or shape should be checked by a physician. Hairs and moles are common. The hair may be tweezed from the mole in the, if the client desires. The benefit, the belief that hair and moles should not be removed is an old wives tale. Moles should be observed for changes with the American Cancer Society's ABCDEs of melanoma check. 
Psoriasis. Psoriasis is an itchy skin disease characterized by red patches covered with white silver scales caused by an overproliferation of skin cells that replicate too fast. Psoriasis is usually found in patches on the scalp, elbows, knees, chest, and lower back. If patches are irritated, bleeding can occur. Psoriasis is not contagious but can spread by irritating the affected area. It is thought to be an autoimmune disorder and clients experience flare-ups that can be controlled with oral and topical medications. Light therapy is also thought to be helpful. Clients with psoriasis are often also diagnosed with cardiovascular disease. Skin tag. Skin tag is a small outgrowth or extension of the skin that looks like a flap. They are benign and are common under the arms, on the neck, or breast area caused by friction. So we have examples on page 149. We have figure 424, psoriasis on an elbow consisting of red patches with that white scaling that they were talking about. And then figure 425, we have an example of a skin tag. Now we are going to define nine contagious skin and nail diseases. The term contagious disease is used interchangeably with the terms infectious or communicable disease. Do not perform services on anyone with a contagious disease because it can spread and infect others. Refer them to a medical professional. The following are contagious diseases. Conjunctivitis, also known as pink eye. Inflammation of the mucous membrane around the eye due to chemical, bacterial, or viral causes. Very contagious. It can be treated with antibiotics. So now we're on page 150. And at the top is a picture of conjunctivitis, also known as pink eye. Next, we're going to read about herpes simplex virus 1. Fever blisters or cold sores, recurring viral infection, a, tes a vesicle or group of vessels of red swollen base. The blister usually appears on the lips or nostrils. Herpes simplex 1 causes cold sores and lesions around the mouth. It is a contagious disease treated with antiviral medication to shorten the outbreak. So please take note that uh, herpes simplex 1 or cold sores do not always just appear on the lips, but they can also uh, present around the nostrils. Herpes simplex virus 2 is genital herpes. Never work on a client with active herpes lesions. Peels, waxing, or other stimuli may cause a breakout even if the condition is not currently active. The virus can spread to other areas on the person that is infected or to other people. This is an example of why reviewing the client's intake form is important. So there are certain treatments that will exacerbate the herpes virus. So even if this client doesn't have it at the time of their treatment, they could have an outbreak after because the skin has been irritated. Um, so they just be careful treating someone with these treatments pay, pay, or conditions, pay attention to their intake form and address those things with them before performing services or don't perform the service if they have an active outbreak. Herpes zoster, also known as shingles, a painful skin condition due to reactivation of the chickenpox virus, also known as the varicella zoster virus or VZV. Shingles is a viral infection of the sensory nerve characterized by groups of red blisters that form a rash that occur in a ring or a line. See figure 429. The rash is typically confined to one side of the body. VZV can cause nerve and organ damage along with severe pain that can last for months or years. Treatments include antiviral drugs to shorten the length of the outbreak. Uh, someone that's had this can, can definitely be very sensitive for months it says, or even years. So I know someone got that while we were in school and she was sensitive for months following her outbreak and it made her just um, very sensitive to everything. Next, we have Infantago. It's a bacterial infection of the skin that often occurs in children characterized by clusters of small blisters or crusty lesions filled with bacteria. It is extremely contagious, see figure 430. Oral and topical antibiotics are used in treatment. An untrained eye may misinterpret impentago and assume herpes, acne, or dermatitis. Professional medical intervention is the correct course of action for your client. 
Next we have onychomycosis, onychomycosis, which is a fungal infection that produces symptoms of thick, brittle, discolored nails. The fungus lives off the keratin in the nails. Onychomycrosis can be challenging to eradicate because fungus likes to grow in dark, moist places and shoes can be a perfect environment. Clients with this can feel embarrassed about the appearance of the nails and discouraged and discouraged during the course of treatment because it's slow nail growth. Estheticians could encounter this when doing body wraps or during hand and foot massages with the facial. If it is discovered, the facial service can be continued, but the esthetician should not continue with the hand or foot massage. So I just finished reading page 150 and there on figure 427, we have the herpes simplex virus one on the lips and figure 428, has the herpes lesions and it says never work on a client who has active herpes lesions. So definitely take a look at those and I suggest looking at other images online because they can present differently uh, in different people. So we have page 151. We have four figures at the top. Figure 429 is the herpes zoster, also known as shingles. It's characterized by a group of red blisters that form a rash in a ring or a line. Figure 430 is infantago, which is characterized by a cluster of small blisters or crusty lesions filled with bacteria and is extremely contagious. Figure 431, we have onychromo, so I never say that, onychomycosis, so sorry, which is a fungal infection that produces symptoms of thick, brittle, discolored nails. And then figure 432 is tinea corpora, Corporis, oh my gosh, sorry, also known as ringworm, is caused by a fungus that spreads into a red or scaly circular infection. So ringworm's pretty easy to spot. It almost always creates a perfect circle. Tinea, which is fungal infections. Fungi feed on proteins, carbohydrates, and lipids in the skin. Tinea pettis, or athlete's foot, is a fungal infection that can be treated with antifungal to topical powders, sprays, or creams. Estheticians could encounter this type of infection when doing body wraps or during a hand and foot massage with the facial. If you are reviewing a client's intake form and see the word tinea, you will know that the client has a fungus and you should determine the location prior to treatment. Tinea corporis, also known as ringworm, caused by fungus is not a worm. It looks like skin, a skin irritation that spreads into a circular infection that is red and scaly. It can be dry or moist. It can spread by direct contact as well as indirect contact with items that have touched the skin of the infected person. Pets can carry this. It is important to use a fungicide to disinfect items that have come in contact with a client who has this infection, including clothing, blankets, and towels. It can be treated with either oral or topical antifungals. Veruca, also known as wart, a wart, a hypertrophy of the papillae and epidermis caused by a virus. They are not cancerous, but they are contagious. Verrucas are typically flesh colored, but can be brown or black. They can appear singly or in a cluster. See figure 433. In figure 433, they have a wart or a verruca is typically flesh colored, but can be brown or black and may also appear singly or in a cluster, so just what I said. Um, the picture is a wart on a finger. Verrucas are not well understood. They can spontaneously disappear, but there are several treatment options, including cryotherapy, electric therapy, surgical excision, and chemical exfoliation. Chemical exfoliation involves an application of a strong salicylic acid at home that peels a wart off in layers. When treating a client with warts, it is imperative that you wear gloves to avoid spreading the virus to other locations on the client's body or inadvertently to another client. It says on the side of page 152, caution, do not work on clients if you have an open verruca, commonly called a wart or any other contagious condition on any area that would contact the client. Do not touch clients with warts or planter's wart on their feet because these are contagious viruses and you could inadvertently spread the virus. Yikes. 
All right. Identify two mental health conditions that may manifest as skin conditions. Dermatillomania is a form of obsessive compulsive disorder in which the person picks at their skin to the point of injury, infection, or scarring. A person with dermatillomania finds the picking stress relieving and not painful. It can often be socially isolating because severe dermatillomania dermatillomania can be disfiguring. Uninformed people may assume the person has a methamphetamine addiction. Treatment includes cognitive behavior therapy, hypnosis, and medication. Body dysmorphic disorder is a psychological disorder in which the client has a preoccupation with their appearance. They do not have a realistic picture of what they look like. They tend to fixate on minor imperfections and see themselves as disfiguring. They believe others are viewing them negatively because of their physical appearance. They may check the mirror frequently and need an abnormal amount of reassurance that their appearance is acceptable. They may be spa hoppers or have a history with many cosmetic surgeries or treatments to fix their perceived flaws. They are dissatisfied with the outcome after treatments. This client will be challenging to manage and will require medical intervention with cognitive behavior therapy and medications. All right, and on page 152, figure 434, it just says body dysmorphic disorder is a psychological disorder that causes a client to fixate on imperfections. So these clients can be really hard to please because um, nothing ever turns out the way they think it should, or they just have... um, an unrealistic idea of what they look like and what the treatment can do. So on page 153, it says, focus on scientific research. When researching topics, keep an open mind and determine the reliability of the source providing the information. What is found to be true one year may change to new evidence and discoveries. This is true of many topics, including the skin and health sciences. It's important to dig deeper to verify and analyze what we are reading just because it's in print or on the internet does not make it true. Of course, that's something great to keep in mind. Recognize common skin conditions related to skin diseases and disorders. The skin condition in table 4-6 are often symptoms of more than one skin disease or skin disorder. Several of them look very similar to another. If you encounter these conditions, you will need to make an assessment and judgment about treatments. Perhaps a condition is the result of an infection, or is it the appropriate clinical endpoint of an effective treatment? Having confidence in identifying these conditions will give you confidence when determining the treatment plan and also give your clients confidence in your skills. So I turned to page 154 and there is the table four six that they were referring to in the last paragraph, common skin conditions. I am gonna go ahead and read through each one of these. They're very important for us to know. Uh, we have a furuncle, which is known as a boil, a sebaceous abscess filled with pus caused by bacteria in glands or hair follicles. A carbuncle is a group of boils. Edema is swelling from fluid imbalance in the cells or from a response to injury, infection, or medication. Erythema is redness caused by inflammation. Folliculitis, hair grows under the surface instead of growing up and out in the follicle, causing a bacterial infection. These ingrown hairs are common in men, usually from shaving, also referred to as barbae folliculitis, folliculitis barbae, psychosis barbae, or barber's itch. Pseudofolliculitis, also known as razor bumps, resembles folliculitis without the pus or infection. Pruritus, pruritus is the medical term for itching or persistent itching. Statoma is a sebaceous cyst or subcutaneous tumor filled with sebum, ranges in size from a pea to an orange, usually appears on the scalp, neck, and back, also called a wen. That one was definitely on some of my uh, quizzes. Statoma is a sebaceous cyst or subcutaneous tumor filled with sebum, ranges in size from pea to an orange, appears on the scalp, neck, and back, can also be called a win. Uh, Carrying on on page 154, explain five pseudoriferous gland disorders. Disorders of the pseudoriferous glands include the following. And pseudoriferous is the sweat glands, if you'll recall. 
Anhydrous, a deficiency in perspiration due to failure of the sweat glands, often results from fever or skin disease. Anhydrous requires medical treatment. Bromohydrous is foul smelling perspiration, usually in the armpits or in the feet. Bromohydrous is caused by bacteria and yeast that break down the sweat on the surface of the skin. Hyperhidrosis is chronic excessive perspiration caused by heat, genetics, stress, or medication. An FDA approved treatment for hyperhidrosis includes the use of microwave technology to destroy the underarm sudoriferous glands. One treatment is usually up to 80% effective. Neuromodulators like Botox Cosmetic are also used to inhibit the sudoriferous gland production. Page 155, diaphoresis. Excessive perspiration due to an underlying medical condition. Menopause is an example of diaphoresis. Milia rubra, also known as prickly heat, is an acute inflammatory disorder of the sweat glands, resulting in the eruption of red vesicles and burning, itching skin from excessive heat exposure. Recognizing a potentially contagious skin disorder can stop the spread of infection. You can formulate a more specific treatment plan and use the appropriate products when you can identify common skin disorders such as rosacea and acne. Understanding that some skin disorders are contraindications for treatments will help you to avoid negative outcomes. The medical field is progressing and the treatment of skin disorders and diseases is becoming easier with advanced advancements in technology, ingredients, and medications. Although there are hundreds of disorders and diseases, the majority of the ones you may commonly encounter are discussed in this chapter along with some that are unique. Knowledge of skin problems takes years of experience and study, but reference books and credible medical websites are helpful in identifying these disorders and diseases. And on page 155, there is an excellent list of web resources that you can check out to help you get a better understanding and grasp on skin disorders and diseases. So that is everything for disorders and diseases of the skin. Hopefully this will help you prepare for your exams. Thank you and good luck.